the final item of business is a member's business debate on motion 11441 in the name of Ash Denham on NHS at 70. This, motion, this debate will be concluded without any questions being put. With those members who wish to speak in the debate, please press the request to speak buttons now. And I call on Ruth Maguire to open the de debate. <laughs> Ms. Maguire, because you've moved from the back. Ms. Maguire, seven minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. It's a pleasure to be introducing this debate to celebrate the 70th birthday of the NHS here in Scotland. And I look forward to hearing the contributions from across the floor. There's no one in Scotland who's not benefited from the NHS in some way or another, either treated themselves or cared for a loved one. It's become an integral part of Scottish society. On this anniversary, it's appropriate for us to reflect on the transformative effect the NHS has had here in Scotland. None of which would be possible without those who make the NHS the incredible service it is today. The porters, the surgeons, the nurses, the catering staff, the cleaners, the ambulance drivers, paramedics and so many more. We owe a great debt of gratitude to both current and past NHS staff. I thank them all. But in celebrating 70 years of incredible service, we must also remember the circumstance that led to its creation. In the early 20th century, there was no centralised health service. Treatment was expensive and health provision was inconsistent. Investigations into public health exposed high levels of poverty and low levels of public health across Scotland. A doctor's visit could cost as much as 10% of an annual income. It's right that we acknowledge the commitment of both the Labour government and in particular an Iron Bevan in establishing the nationwide NHS to end those conditions. Their commitment to creating a collective health service free at the point of need and paid for through taxation was revolutionary. The Beveridge report was, of course, a main driver of the changes, but we can also look to highly influential reports undertaken here in Scotland. The Dewar Committee report that established the Highlands and Islands Medical Service in 1912, providing state-funded medical care for those unable to afford it, a full three decades before the establishment of the NHS and the Cathcart report that advocated a radical reform of healthcare provision in Scotland, putting GPs at the heart of medical care. These... Yes. David Stewart. Would the member share my view that where the Highlands and Islands leads, the rest of Scotland follows? <laughs> you better say yes, Ms. McGuire. Okay, well, I am a Highland girl, so absolutely, I would, I would say that, yes. <laughs> providing state-funded medical care for those who are unable to afford it a full three decades before the establishment of the NHS and the Cathcart report that advocated a radical reform of healthcare provision in Scotland, putting GPs at the heart of medical care. These created a consensus that action had to be taken to improve the state of Scotland's health well before the introduction of the NHS in 1948. Bevan was right when he described putting the welfare of the sick before every other consideration as the most civilised thing in the world. I do not think that the impact the NHS would have had on Scotland, nor its impact on world medicine, could have been imagined. For in its 70 years, the Scottish NHS has achieved some remarkable accomplishments. Over these past decades, Scottish medical academies and practitioners have been at the forefront of medical discoveries and the development of new treatments that have been both truly world-class and world-changing. Glasgow developed the first practical ultrasound and Glasgow Coma Scale, both exported to the world. Edinburgh is the home of the UK's first successful kidney transplant and where the dangers of thalamidamide were exposed. Aberdeen is home of the first ever MRI scan, while the first keyhole surgery took place in Dundee. The NHS in Dumfries, Aberdeen and Dundee are early pioneers of screening for cervical cancer, while Edinburgh established a UK first to screen for breast cancer. And Scotland is the home of Sir James Black, winner of the 1980s. 88 Nobel Prize for Medicine for his drug discoveries relating to heart disease and stomach ulcers. Staying true to the vision of improved public health, Scotland has twice acted as a world leader, being the first UK nation to introduce the smoking ban and being the first country in the world to introduce minimum unit pricing for alcohol. Under this SNP government, the Scottish Patient Safety Programme has internationally recognised as the first national system to systematically improve the safety and reliability of hospital care, while the diet and obesity strategy continues in this vein of continued progressive action. So as we look back, we can see just what a transformative impact the NHS in Scotland has had on the lives of those living here, but also on the lives of millions across the globe. 
Government are entrusted by the electorate to look after NHS Scotland, to guarantee it for the next generation, and it's a responsibility that must not be taken lightly. I'm proud that this SNP government has delivered on this promise to the ele electorate, overseeing major improvements in the NHS and in public health. The Scottish Government has prioritised health throughout its time in office, successfully protecting the frontline health budget, keeping the NHS publicly owned and free at the point of need, scrapping prescription charges, protecting free eye tests and ensuring continued free personal care for the elderly. Recognising that the NHS cannot provide a world-class service with an imaginary Brexit dividend, we've invested a record amount in the NHS. Scotland now has the highest number of NHS workers on record so that you can see a doctor to get the medical treatment you require, so that your loved ones are cared for properly by nurses and midwives, and delivering the highest GP to patient ratio in the UK so that you can get access to a GP when you need it. We've rewarded our NHS workers, making them the best paid in the UK. The NHS has undergone many changes as it's faced challenges over the years. We must always seek ways to improve the NHS and never shy away from our responsibilities. The SNP is committed to meeting those challenges to retain our NHS's reputation as one of the world's leading health services. As we reflect on 70 successful years, we can see why the NHS is held in such high regard in Scotland. It has delivered a revolutionary service, free of charge at the point of need, creating a healthier, fairer Scotland. And it's a source of great pride as an innovative, world-class service. So it's right that we celebrate it now and take this time to imagine how much further we can go in the next 70 years. Presiding officer. Thank you very much, Ms. McGuire. I call Brian Whittle to be followed by David Stewart. Mr. Whittle, please. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And can I first draw members' attention to my register of interests? And I have a close family member who's a healthcare professional with the Scottish NHS. I'd also like to congratulate Ash Denham uh, for securing time in this chamber to celebrate the 70 years of our most treasured institution. I also want to take the opportunity to welcome the new front bench led by uh, Cabinet Secretary uh, Jean Freeman and wish them well in their new appointments. And in doing that, I want to take the opportunity to thank uh, Shona Robson for her time uh, as Cabinet Secretary. I know we didn't always agree on everything, but I think no one could deny her commitment to the post. And on a personal level, I want to specifically thank her for all her help in, in constituency cases, some of which were very delicate and complicated. I think it's an element of this job that is not often mentioned nor seen by the public, but she was always willing to help in finding solutions. And I just wanted to put that on the record, Deputy Presiding Officer. Now, this is the second debate in as many days in the Chamber. Such is the positive strength of feeling uh, supporting our NHS, NHS and all the staff who deliver what is, and is sometimes forgotten in the heat of debate, a world-renowned service. It is without doubt held up as a shining light in health delivery by countries around the world, and we have quite rightly recognised the incredible work our NHS staff do on a daily basis, both in yesterday's debate and again in this one. I was looking back into 1948 uh, when the NHS uh, came into being, and at that time, Uwe Willie was on his upturned bucket, uh, offering weekly cheer along with the Bruins, and in sport, which I have to mention sport, Hibs had won the league, Rangers won the cup, East Fife won the league cup, and Henry Corton had just won his third British Open at Muirfield. And Cathy Gibson from Motherwell was about to head off to the London Olympics, where she became the only British swimming medalist. But I was thinking that the more things change, the more they seem to stay the same. In 1948, there was a recognition that major change was needed to look after the health of the nation and also tackle those health inequalities. And here we are 70 years later with all the incredible developments in treatments and procedures still debating those self-same issues. This morning, Lewis MacDonald and I chaired a, a conference entitled Next Steps for Integrated and Social Care in Scotland, Governance, Workforce Planning and Improving Delivery of Care. Wonderful title, I have to say. I wouldn't mean to short that bit. What came out loud and clear is that major change is underway and further change is required. They, they, they are wrestling with, with the implementation of the integrated joint board policy. It's also very clear that prevention must move further up the agenda if the current health inequalities are to be tackled. And, and I've, I did raise the point again this morning, that I thought the first step in developing a preventable agenda is looking after the health of our healthcare professionals. 
and it's COSLA that said that, that healthcare professionals will forego their own health to deliver care to others. And that is the nature of those who decide to go into the care of others in the NHS. However, if, if we are to strive for a healthier nation, we require those that we charge with delivering that policy to themselves have the opportunity to have that active, healthy lifestyle. Currently, our nurses, midwives, among others, are on average unhealthier than the rest of our population. And this is a result of the workload that they willingly accept to ensure the good health of others. So I think in celebrating 70 years of the NHS, we should be looking ahead at the next 70 years to ensure the sustainability and the very basis of the NHS, which is free health care at the point of need. We're going to have to accept change. And in fact, we're going to have to drive the change uh, that healthcare profession, uh, the healthcare profession itself is asking for. And I look forward to continuing this debate uh, with the new Scottish Government's new health team. Deputy Presiding Officer. Thank you very much. I call David Stewart to be followed by Emma Harper. <coughs> Mr Stewart, please. Um, thank you, uh, Presiding Officer, and congratulations to Ash Denham for securing this evening's debate and for her elevation to ministerial ranks. Uh, well done to Ruth Maguire for stepping up to the plate, uh, I presume at the last moment, and I'd also welcome Jean Freeman, Claire Hockey uh, and Joe Fitzpatrick to their new roles and every success in your new role. Clearly, white smoke has been much in evidence uh, for Zion Officer the last few days, but I would also like to place on record my thanks to Sean Robertson, particularly for the help um, she has given, uh, along with Bowie and Watt, to the work I was carrying out in diabetes. Uh, my colleague Anna Sauer has asked me to pass on his apologies. Uh, he's speaking in London this evening to a Westminster APPG on Islamophobia. Um, Nye launched the NHS at the Park Hospital in Manchester, where the first ever patient was 13-year-old Sylvia Beckingham. She was treated for a liver condition. That was a big event in her life, but an even bigger event in British history the birth of a national icon and institution. No one presiding officer could have predicted how Nye Bevan's infant would grow. If it would survive its early days, develop into adulthood, even if it would mature into old age. Yet the NHS, our NHS, is turning 70 years old. And its story is impressive. The uniting of all the hospitals and the doctor surgeries into state-run service was groundbreaking in the Western world. In the 1970s, we had the first heart and liver transplants. The first kidney transplant took place here in Edinburgh Royal Infirmary. The 1970s saw the first test tube baby and CT scans, which revolutionized the way doctors examined patients. Breast cancer screening was introduced in the 1980s, and the 2000s saw a new emphasis on public health with measures such as the smoking ban. And Nye Bevan and Labour Party successfully founded the NHS over the teeth of strong opposition and three score and ten years later, the Labour Party are still defending it. And I'm proud of belonging to a party with that 70-year-old pedigree. But I'm proud of still of its hard-working frontline staff, the junior doctors, the nurses, the midwives, the consultants, GPs, allied health professionals, porters and receptionists. But despite their hard work and commitment, we face a number of challenges. Our ageing population, pressure on social care, the need for robust workforce planning now and post-Brexit, and a growing mental health crisis. The nature of these public health challenges may look modern, but under the surface, the root causes are the same. Poverty, social deprivation, and inequality are significant contributors to poor health expectations, and it's the least well-off who are most at risk. So inequality in health was a serious issue at the birth of the NHS, and it remains a serious issue today. Life expectancy in the UK has stalled, and in the last 50 years, the chasm between the health outcomes of the rich and the poor has widened. Is it not an outrage that in our 21st century society, individuals' health expectations are intrinsically linked to their postcode? But in reality, innovation will be the key to the future of the NHS. So we must ensure that good ideas are embraced with open arms. For example, flash glucose monitoring with Freestyle Libra monitors has revolutionised the management of glucose for individuals with diabetes. And I've supported Diabetes Scotland's campaign for monitors to be available across all of Scotland's health boards and to fight the postcode lottery. In England, five NHS trusts are trialling a step into health programme which utilises transferable skills of armed forces veterans and encourages them into the NHS workforce. There are exciting developments in the fight against superbugs with the use of UVC light to sanitise surgical tools in 60 seconds using the nanoclave cabinet designed with the tech firm Physicen. Pioneering initiatives and technology research as this 
must be encouraged if we're going to steward the NHS through the next 70 years in the 21st century. Nye Bevan's words from the start of the NHS are as applicable today as they were then. The NHS will last as long as there's folk left with faith to fight for it. Thank you very much, Mr Stewart. I call Emma Harper to be followed by Alison Johnson. Ms Harper, please. Thank you, President Officer. Um, I'd like to congratulate my colleague Ash Denham in securing this historic, significant and celebratory debate and Ruth Maguire for eloquently outlining historical information leading to the formation of the NHS. This is a personally significant debate for me as I proudly direct you to my register of interests. I started my nurse training in 1984 and I'm very proud to be a nurse. In fact, I've got three sisters who are also nurses and between us, the Harper sisters have almost 140 years of NHS nursing experience. And part of Ash Denham's motion states, um, salutes continuous hard work and contributions of NHS staff throughout the years. Indeed, I am keen to focus to celebrate the staff who have cared, contributed and collaborated for 70 years. From the phlebotomist who often has patients who are sick, tired, peripherally shut down and yet they still manage to find a vein to take blood. This is our NHS. The radiographers also who show empathy, care and are discreet when obtaining your mammogram. This is our NHS. My first Saturday in the operating room at DGRI as a new staff nurse, um, I had a patient with a ruptured aortic aneurysm. I was brand new and Christina Marshall and John Carnican kept me right. The whole team were fantastic. The patient survived following lots of fresh frozen plasma and lots of red blood cells. And I accompanied, accompanied the patient to the ICU. The roles involved in that one case, surgeon, assistant surgeons, anaesthetists, lab techs, blood donors, phlebotomists, floor nurses, scrub nurses, anaesthetic nurses, ICU and radiology technicians, 13 experts. This is our NHS. Comfort, care, collaboration, experts. I've worked in NHS Scotland, NHS England, and I spent 14 years as an economic migrant working at Cedar sinai Medical Centre in Los Angeles as a transplant nurse and nurse educator. It was that experience of working in private healthcare in the USA that truly showed me how essential and amazing our NHS is. I know from first-hand experience what an awful, frustrating conundrum it is for people who cannot afford to get sick, cannot afford to be injured, or cannot afford their medication. When I was in the USA, it cost me $800, pounds every, $800 every month for health insurance. So that was about 600 quid. And that didn't cover my type 1 diabetes. I had to pay for my insulin, my syringes, my test strips, my blood testing machine. And Dave has just noted that we now have more um, blood testing and development technology, which is absolutely fantastic. So we are so lucky to have our NHS. We need to protect it and not just the health service. We need to protect our free prescriptions and we need to protect every single person who works in our NHS. People who work in our NHS experience trauma, tragedy and triumph every day. And an important thing to remember, the NHS may be 70 years in existence, but it's not a collector's item. It is not old and it is not a thing of the past. Our NHS has never rested on its laurels. Its laurels. It is an ever-changing, ever-improving, ever-growing dynamic health service. That's the triumph of our NHS. I know it seems like change comes as slow as turning a big oil tanker, but when you're in the NHS, the change and performance improvement, the best practice is constantly evolving and changing. So, presiding officer, our NHS is a national treasure. It is constantly improving and adapting. So I'd like to make sure we continue to support it and finally, presiding officer, I'd like to thank Shona Robinson for her contribution, her hard work and excellence. And as CAB secretary, we now have a new team. I'd like to welcome the new team to the front bench and look forward to working with Jean Freeman, Claire Hockey and Joe Fitzpatrick in the future. Thank you. I'm not allowed to applaud. A great shame. I sometimes want to applaud. Uh, Ms Johnson, please. Thank Followed you. by... Let me get my glasses. Annie Wells. Thank 
Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, I too would like to begin by congratulating the new health front bench. Um, I look forward to working with you to improve Scotland's health. And I'd also like to thank Shona Robison for her clear commitment to doing so, um, to improving our national health. Her door was always open, and I'm sure yours will be too. Um, presiding Officer, there is much to be proud of about our, our NHS, so much to be proud of. And I'm delighted that we're marking its 70th year by paying tribute to all the staff who make it the incredible service it is and such an important part of our national life in Scotland. The roots of the NHS here in Scotland go even further back to the Dewar Commission of 1912, which helped to establish the Highlands and Islands Medical Service in 1913. Dr Annie Tindley's research has helped us to discover the importance of the Dewar Report and when we celebrated the Dewar centenary with a debate in Parliament, it led us to question how care and treatment in rural areas could be better supported today. There is much we can learn from the history of our health service. While it's vital to support innovation in our health care and treatment, we must never stop looking back at the collective endeavour and values that have been its foundation. Members have rightly highlighted the incredible advances we've seen in medical treatment since the NHS began. And if we want to build on those and ensure every generation looks forward to better health than the last, then we have to renew that sense of collective care and ambition in other aspects of our public life. <clears throat> in recent years, we've seen, for the first time in a long time, life expectancy in the UK begin to fall. And it's not a coincidence that this has happened in an age of austerity. Professor Danny Dorling is clear that the politics of austerity are the most plausible reason for this troubling trend. Professor Michael Marmot links this to the UK government's spending record and states that social expenditure is amongst the most miserly of Western European countries. The impact seems to be most severe in areas of high deprivation, which have suffered deindustrialisation and are now being hit by another round of welfare reform. We are, I am sure, united in believing that your life expectancy shouldn't depend on where you're born. But our health is still being damaged by economic inequality and many other forms of discrimination and prejudice. Martin Luther King said that of all the forms of inequality, injustice in health is the most shocking and the most inhuman. But we still see severe health inequalities in Scotland and not only between the richest and poorest parts of the country. The links between poverty and mental health are so clear. The impact of damp, cold housing and a poor diet on our health is so obvious. If we don't fix these problems, our NHS takes the strain. And above all, we can never, as others have said, give up the principle that healthcare must be free at the point of need. And in Scotland, we've made the decision that vital social care should be free at the point of need too. On ending charges for personal social care, Shona Robison listened and she should be applauded for making that position a reality. I also believe we could still go further and end in charges for other care, but I've no doubt that the changes this Parliament have pushed for will have long-term benefits for our collective health and our NHS. Let's not forget that minimum unit pricing has now been introduced too. But it's right that at times we call for change within the NHS itself. But I, I reflect on the Nuffield Foundation's view that where the NHS in England has been hampered by multiple reforms, marketisation and competing priorities, the NHS here has benefited in some ways from a consistent approach to improvement and openness to collaboration. I heard with alarm the news that the private healthcare firm Virgin Care won £2 million of public money by suing NHS England. We have to make sure that our NHS and the public are protected from corporate interests. The prospect of leaving the EU raises real concerns too. And the new Cabinet Secretary for Health must be absolutely resolute in defending the NHS in Scotland. Presiding officer, I'm glad to celebrate the achievements and ambitions of the NHS today. Our society doesn't always feel like a caring place, but every day there are patients in our waiting rooms and hospital beds who know they can trust the nurse they'll see, the doctor they'll meet, wherever they are and whatever treatment they need. The efforts of thousands of healthcare professionals, researchers, administrators and support staff make that treatment possible and we must never underestimate how much we all rely on them. Thank you. Thank you. I call Annie Wells, we're followed by Jackie Bailey. Ms Wells, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And may I also welcome the front bench of the health team to the chamber today and thank Ash Denham for securing this debate this evening. It's absolutely fantastic we have the opportunity to contribute in this debate that celebrates a national service renowned across the world. And I too wish to give my heartfelt thanks to every member of the NHS's hard-working staff, 
people who work tirelessly under extreme pressing conditions. And I think we've all had our own personal experiences of the NHS. And one that will always stick in my mind was eight years ago, we got the, the call you would never expect to say, I think it's time to come up and say um, goodbye to, to your dad. We went up to the hospital and the, the staff that were looking after my dad says, we aren't, we're not giving up, but we just wanted to give you that opportunity to say y your final farewells. It was only through their expertise, their determination and their extremely hard work that we managed to keep my dad for, for an extra three years, three years that we could spend with him. And for that, I will be ever truly grateful. And I'm also extremely grateful to have a debate that allows time to reflect on what the NHS represents to us as a nation and to celebrate all that it has to offer. Over the last 70 years, the NHS has transformed the health and well-being of our nation, delivering huge medical advances and allowing people to live longer lives. Officially formed in 1948 and pioneered by, pioneered by Labour MP and then Health Secretary Nye Bevan, the NHS for the first time brought hospitals, doctors, nurses, pharmacists, opticians and dentists together under one umbrella to provide services for free at the point of delivery. In Scotland, the service was set up by a separate act passed a, a year earlier to reflect the country's own established medical traditions, as well as its links to Asim medical schools and ancient universities. And since then, we've seen many milestones in Scotland. And I too wish to highlight the great successes as many others have. In 1960, the UK's first successful kidney transplant took place right here in Edinburgh at the Royal Infirmary. In 1980, the world's first clinical service for MRIs was launched at Aberdeen Royal Infirmary. And in 1989, keyhole surgery was used for the first time in the UK at Nine Wells Hospital in Dundee. Fast forward 70 years from its inception, and we can see how much things have changed and positive impact this has had on our population's health. 140,000 staff are now employed by NHS Scotland, and in 2016-17 alone, it performed 1.5 million hospital procedures and conducted around 17 million GP consultations. There are growing demands, and it's important to reflect on that also. In the years since the NHS was set up, demographic and health trends have changed significantly, on top of increasing costs, the NHS has seen a growing demand for its services, meaning that more people are waiting longer to be seen. The pressure on staff is, is, is a huge concern, and it's thanks to the huge passion of those who work in the NHS that the quality of care has remained at the level it has. In finishing today, I would like again to stress the importance of supporting our hard-working NHS staff. As it celebrates its 70th birthday, the NHS faces many challenges across Scotland. And today is not the day to raise them, but I would like to make the very important point that for our society to flourish as a whole, building a sustainable NHS fit for the future must be a top priority. The correct resources and fresh vision for the future must be outlined. At some point in their lives, everyone in Scotland will use a service provided or funded by the NHS. And we owe to all our citizens to ensure that the NHS experience is the highest standards at all times. Thank you very much. I call Jackie Bailey to be followed by Sandra White. Miss Bailey, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Let me join with others in congratulating Ash Denham for securing debating time and on her promotion, which explains her absence from the chamber today. And indeed, thank Ruth Maguire for standing in in incredibly short notice and for the content of her speech. Let me also join with others in welcoming the new Cabinet Secretary, Jean Freeman, um, and her team, Claire Hockey and Joe Fitzpatrick, to their new positions. Um, they can be sure that I will be a path to their door about the Vale of Leaven Hospital, amongst other things. But incidentally, the Vale of Leaven Hospital was, of course, the first hospital built after the creation of the NHS. I also want to thank Shona Robson and Maureen Watt for their contribution to the NHS and to government as well. I think the NHS is arguably Labour's greatest achievement, probably the greatest achievement in my view of any government. When you think back to that 1945 Labour government, they had a radical vision and they acted quickly to deliver it. The creation of the welfare state, the creation of the NHS, all at a time of severe post-war austerity. But it signalled the kind of country we want to be. As Anaya and Bevan said, no society can legitimately call itself civilised if a sick person is denied medical aid because of a lack of means. And so on the 5th of July, 1948, our NHS 
was born. You didn't need to pay for your health care if you were ill. You weren't penalised as a result of ill health. Instead, this was a cost shared by all. Equality and social justice, the founding basis of the NHS, and three core principles at the heart of that. That it meets the needs of everyone, that it be free at the point of delivery, that it is based on clinical need, not the ability to pay. And whilst these principles hold good today, there have been some challenges. Medicine itself has changed dramatically over the years. That's a positive thing. We're all living longer. Some diseases have been completely eradicated. That's great. But we're not necessarily healthier. And there are more and more of us appearing in our hospitals. And it is the case that whilst there may be more money and more staff, um, the reality is we're treating many, many more people than we ever have before. That causes considerable strain. We see it in the un unfilled vacancies because we don't have enough doctors and nurses. We see it in the increasingly long waiting times in my area for orthopedics and ophthalmology. People waiting in pain for more than 52 weeks. We see it in the longer cancer waiting times where hundreds of patients you know, are let down by the system. And we know that the longer they wait, the more it has an impact on their mortality. Across a whole range of areas, there are huge challenges. I'm not going to point to them all, but I recognize that our NH staff, NHS staff do a tremendous job for which we can't ever begin to thank them enough. But they are overworked, they are understaffed. We can't expect them to do ever more with declining resources, and that's something I know is a concern shared across the chamber. Presiding officer, Bevan's vision, despite the challenges and the changes in medicine, has stood the test of time. At the centre of his vision was the NHS. 70 years on, it remains at the centre of the life of our nation. A unique institution, not just in Scotland, but across the UK, and still a uniquely powerful engine of social justice that we all value in the years to come. Thank you. Thank you. I call Sandra White to be followed by Jeremy Balfour. Ms White, please. Thank, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Uh, can I thank Ash Derham for securing this debate and uh, congratulate Ruth Maguire for stepping in uh, in, in a very well-delivered speech as well. Uh, Presiding Officer, I want to take this opportunity to personally thank uh, Shona Robinson for all the work that she's done in her time as a Cabinet Secretary and Health Secretary. The door was always open, as already been said, and I'm sure, it's said as well, it will be opened again uh, for the new team that's there. So I wish her well in her future role, and I do welcome Jean Freeman to her new role. Um, it'll be a challenge, but I'm sure that she and the team, Joe Fitzpatrick, and the others will certainly rise to that challenge, and uh, I look forward to working with them as well. I have to point out that I found um, Emma Harper's uh, contribution very, very moving. And uh, it was something that rung true with me because part of uh, my um, contribution is possibly not the same because I don't have the experience of Emma, but slight, slightly similar uh, because um, not that I'm as old as the NHS, but I do, I do remember uh, many years ago, uh, my grandmother and my mother uh, as well, uh, they would talk about the times when they couldn't afford medical care, they couldn't afford a doctor. As has been said previously, people had to pay for that. And sometimes whole closes chipped together, chipped in together to get money to pay for a doctor to come along whole streets even. I'm sure it's the same perhaps in, in villages as well, where people, they, you know, the communities would chip in together. And uh, never more so so much when it was to do with maternity care. When we think of the amount of women who seriously died during childbirth because they couldn't afford a doctor or a midwife, and it's something that uh, is really, really important, the fact that the community spirit people did uh, put forward, get money for people to come to see them without uh, having to, you know, basically go to money lenders as they were then as well. So I think it's, it's something that uh, seems pretty unbelievable now when we look at what we've got, and that's why it's really, really important that we ensure that uh, we celebrate the NHS, but we make sure that privatisation does not creep in, as Emma has said, who's had that first-hand experience and such an emotional um, contribution. I don't think anyone would have been not moved by it. And we must ensure that healthcare remains free at the point of, of use, delivery, is available to all, 
We must ensure that privatisation, as I said, is never brought forward and is never an option. Uh, basically, that people never have to borrow and scrape to actually receive healthcare. I think that's a really important message. We certainly have moved on, and uh, you know, 1947 it did start in Scotland, albeit smaller, uh, and then 1948 the rest of the UK. Uh, but the improvements that's been put forward in, in public health, the NHS, has basically been absolutely fantastic. Can't believe. I'm sure people couldn't believe that we'd move on uh, to that in 70 years. There's no comparison, basically, went on then and what is going on just now in that respect. And we're looking at lots of other strategies, not in public health, you know, to do with tobacco, obesity, alcohol, diets. They are all further improve our health, and I think it's absolutely fantastic. But I know I'm quite short out of time. But on a personal note, I really have nothing but praise for the NHS. The treatment that my family received when I member of my family was taken very ill, was absolutely second to none. Intensive care, the staff were absolutely fantastic. Uh, nothing was too much trouble for them. A one-to-one -one service. I never heard the NHS staff complain once, particularly when we were asking them questions. What's that machine for? What's the other machine for? Uh, they would tell us. It was absolutely fantastic. And I have nothing but praise for them. And the other part is the aftercare. We don't talk enough about that, but the aftercare that we received was unbelievable. And it still goes on just now. Phone calls appointments, people coming out of the house, it's absolutely fantastic. And it obviously goes without saying that personally I and everyone here are absolutely indebted to the many people who work in the health service and I personally want to thank them very, very much. Thank you. I have to say to Miss White, I've just realised I'm older than the NHS. There we go. Yes, I'm afraid so guys, afraid so. I called Jeremy Balfour last speaker in the open debate. Uh, thank you uh, very much, uh, Deputy President Officer. In, in the short time that I have, I would like to give three words that I think, for me, define the NHS. And with your permission, three personal examples of how that has worked out in my life. The first is innovation. And we've heard that from other speakers already tonight, that things such as kidney transplants, other cutting-edge technology, have been developed through our NHS, both here in Scotland and the UK. If I could take you back 51 years ago when I was born, I was born with just one finger. And at the age of six months, a Douglas Lamb, who was the consultant here at the PMR, decided to take the innovation of cutting that finger to give me two fingers. Never been done before. But that innovation allowed me to be able to do so much more than I would have been done just with one finger. Beyond that, not just uh, Mr. Lamb, who is sadly no longer with us, but OTs, physios, auxiliaries, nurses, paid such a compliment into my life that allows me to be able to stand here today. So for people like Mr. Lamb, for those who are willing to take a risk to help someone, we say thank you. Secondly, for me, the NHS is caring and compassionate. I have experienced that on numerous occasions in my life. As a 13-year-old about to go through a scoliosis operation, the time the nurses spent with me the night before is something even all that time I remember. But if I can take you, presiding officer, to eight years ago, to a Saturday afternoon. When my little girl was born asleep. The worst moment in my life. But what I remember is not just the pain of her loss, but it is the care and love that was given by the midwives, by the nurses, by the auxiliaries, to me and my wife. The caring and compassion is something that defines our NHS, and we should say thank you. And third and finally, it is the dedication and the going the extra mile of the doctors. Because if I can take you forward 
from that period, that dark period in our lives, to just seven years ago. My wife had been through a difficult pregnancy. We were expecting twin girls. We were going to have to end up in special care at the Simpsons here in Edinburgh. And we had to wait until there were two spaces available there. Our consultant, Shona Cowan, had worked a 24-hour shift. When that morning it was announced that there were two spaces available. She went home for a short sleep, came back on her day off to deliver my two girls. That is going the extra mile. And that is what doctors, nurses, auxiliaries, physios, everything with MBHS do on a daily basis. And I think across this chamber, although we have political differences and divides, all of us can unite in saying, happy birthday, NHS. Thank you very much for that, Mr. Balfour. It's very difficult for you, but it was an extraordinary speech um, and mean, must mean a lot to those in the NHS, those of you who've shared your experiences. Um, I know I shouldn't say these things, but I'm all upset by it. Um, I now call uh, Jean Freeman to close the government. I have to call you Minister just now because you've not yet been voted in by the Parliament, technically. So, Ms Freeman, please. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Presiding Officer. And let me start by thanking all the members who have contributed to this debate, in particular for the spirit in which we've held this debate. And can I thank, in particular, uh, Emma Harper, Sandra White and Jeremy Balfour for being willing to share with us such deeply personal but very important experiences and stories which encapsulate what the NHS means to so many people across Scotland. I am absolutely delighted that the first words that I am saying in this chamber as Cabinet Secretary designate for health and sport is to pay tribute to the work of NHS staff, both past and present, on the occasion of NHS's 70th birthday. And subject to parliamentary approval, let me say on my own behalf and behalf of my colleagues in the health team, how much we look forward to continuing the work of those who have gone before us and absolutely working to secure the precious NHS that we have in Scotland. Um, across the, Jackie Bailey was quite right, of course, to remind us of the importance of that founding vision and of that uh, Labour government acting on it. But it wasn't an easy birth and we need to remember that that birth itself was in many ways resisted by those who feared it, by those who felt that it would work against their personal interests, and by those who did not see the value of that collective investment that we make together and have done over those generations in something as vital to daily life as our health. I too, as Sandra White, has recounted well remember, in my case, my mother and my father, describing the situation before there was a National Health Service, my grandfather being a herbalist because that was one of the ways that he would provide some degree of health care and support in his village. But the huge impact of the introduction of the NHS on all of their lives, and indeed, as Sandra White said, uh, often in particular, on the lives of women. The NHS is an essential part of all our lives. It is true for members of this parliament and for every person in the country, and it has been true for 70 years. The NHS has provided world-class medical care to successive generations. It has adap adapted and evolved during that time, but has always main, remained true to its founding principle of being free at the point of delivery. Members have mentioned many of the achievements of our health service here in Scotland. I would add one of my own, and that is the Caldon pain technique developed at the Golden Jubilee National Hospital and being effective across the country in reducing pain for uh, very many people going through elective orthopaedic surgery and making a significant difference indeed 
to their hospital stay. And I was reminded only the other day that not, not more than a few years ago, part of our debate on health would always have focused on uh, infection and how much work across our health service has been done to challenge and eradicate and minimise where it is not possible to eradicate uh, hospital-acquired infection. The NHS has always faced challenges from its earliest days until the present. And David Stewart, Emma Harper, Alison Johnson and others are right to talk about its history of innovation. And I am proud that in Scotland, we invest as a government in the Innovation Centre at Clydebank, specifically to encourage and turn into practice innovative ideas that will make a practical difference to patients and to those who work in our health service. Demand on services, of course, continues to rise, and so rightly do expectations. There is no doubt that the ways we deliver health and social care in Scotland must continue to evolve and improve in order to deliver safe, affordable and sustainable services in the future. Services that continue to meet those expectations. Our health and social care delivery plan sets out our shared framework for delivering on the challenges that face us. And work is well underway at both the national and the regional level. Health boards and their partners across health and social care are coming together to develop and implement proposals that will increase the pace of improvement and focus our efforts on what is needed for better care, better health and better value. And one of the key cornerstones of that is, of course, the What Matters to You programme, where we focus or with patients on what matters to them. Between the publication of the delivery plan and the end of 2018-19, we expect to see a 7% reduction in acute unscheduled bed days across Scotland. That's about 280,000 bed days, a huge step in the right direction for patients and staff. And only this morning, I witnessed and learned something about the initiative being taken here in Edinburgh at the ERI and with general uh, GP practices across the city to focus on that what matters to you and in doing so improve the health care, the speed of health care and reduce the number of un unscheduled and other visits to A&E. Across Scotland, the latest published data from February will show that since August 2016, the number of days spent in hospital by people where discharge was delayed has reduced by over 15%. But I am in absolutely no doubt that there is scope for further improvements. Our focus on prevention, integration and closer collaboration to deliver improved population health is one of the central themes of the delivery plan. And I absolutely recognise all of the challenges that members have so thoughtfully and, if I may say so, maturely described. And it is my firm belief, as I believe one of our members said, that if we can, where, we, where it is possible to do so, work collaboratively across parties and across this chamber, then there are many uh, problems and issues that I am convinced we can collectively solve. We will, of course, continue to politically disagree on some matters, and that is fine. But yes, of course. Maurice Corry. Uh, thank you, Deputy Speaker. Um, I thank the Deputy, uh, sorry, I thank the Cabinet Secretary designate for giving way. Uh, would the Cabinet Secretary designate agree with me that the NHS staff in Scotland, as reservists in the armed forces, have provided the most magnificent support to our armed forces in many conflict zones throughout the world since the NHS in Scotland was formed? Ms. Freeman. I certainly would. And indeed, our NHS staff provide significant and important services in many different settings, not least in our prison service and elsewhere. We have made huge strides over the past 70 years in public health. I am very proud indeed of the fact that we're leading the way on minimum pricing of alcohol. It's a bold policy that I believe shows our commitment to public health and a policy we stuck with through many difficult trials and tribulations. Looking ahead, the development of an agreed set of public health priorities is now complete, producing priorities for the whole public sector. Work is also well underway with COSLA and with SOLAS to develop the new public health body that will direct public health improvement across the country. Alongside our quest for improved services, 
we know that we can only make a difference to people's lives as a result of the dedicated, skilled and talented staff working within our health service. Every single achievement and success over the past 70 years would not have happened without their hard work and commitment. And that's why we announced on Monday that Agenda for Change staff working in the health service in Scotland will be offered at least a 9% pay rise over the next three years, the highest pay uplift across these islands. That will cover around 170,000 staff, covering nurses, midwives, allied health professionals, paramedics, porters and others. And it is a recognition of the value we place on their work and I hope we'll see an increase in our ability to recruit and retain the staff we need in order to continue to provide not only innovation, but high quality, compassionate services. <clears throat> Presiding officer, in conclusion, as a government and I'm certain as a parliament, our task uh, as we go forward is that when we pass this vital service, this vital compassionate service on to future generations, that it has a clear direction and a solid foundation, grounded in a workforce that is valued and gives value back to the service throughout the working lives of each one of them. Let me finally conclude by paying tribute to Shona Robeson and Maureen Watt and to their predecessors, but particularly Ms. Ms. Robeson and Ms. Watt for their work for our health service and their work as fine public servants. And by saying lastly, a very sincere and a very well meant and deeply meant thank you from across this chamber and from this team to all our health and social care staff, to volunteers who work in the health service across Scotland for their hard work, their dedication, and above all, the care and the compassion they deliver every single day. We owe them a huge debt of gratitude and we will not forget that. Thank you. Can I thank all members for their contributions? And that concludes the debate and I close this meeting of Parliament.